Good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. I'm Council Member Adrian Adams, the Chair of this Subcommittee. Today we are joined by Council Members Ku, Barron, Traeger, and Van Brainer. Today we will hold public hearings on two school site selections. We will then vote on those items and two landmark designations on which we held public hearings last month. Finally, we will hold a public hearing on an application for a site selection and acquisition for a combined sewer overflow facility for the Gowanus Canal Superfund site. The two school site selections we will hear are applications submitted by the School Construction Authority pursuant to Section 1732 of the New York School Construction Authority Act. LU39 is an application for a proposed site selection for a new approximately 612 seat primary school facility known as PSQ 375 to be located on Block 6, Lot 130 in the Borough of Queens in Community School District 30. LU40 is an application for a proposed site selection for a new approximately 572 seat primary school facility known as PSQ 341 to be located on Block 6, part of Lot 60, also in the Borough of Queens in Community School District 30. Both sites are located in Council Member Van Bramer's district. Representatives of the School Construction Authority will present both items today. We will then hear testimony from the public on each item individually. If you would like to testify on these items, please see the Sergeant at Arms and fill out an appearance slip indicating the item on which you intend to speak. I would like to recognize Council Member Van Bramer at this time to give us his remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for uh, allowing me to participate in your very important hearing today. Uh, these two schools are in my district. They are desperately needed, and today marks a tremendous victory for the people, the families, the children of Long Island City and School District 30 by approving these two schools we will be adding nearly 1,200 new seats in Long Island City. This is perhaps the fastest growing neighborhood in the city of New York, if not the entire United States of America. But you cannot have a healthy community without good schools and without parents knowing that they will have a place to send their children in their own neighborhood. So we have had a crisis uh, in and around this fast growing part of my district. We are uh, pushing incredibly hard for even more schools, but by hearing this, by voting this through, uh, and by beginning the process of building these two new schools, I know that parents and families in Long Island City will breathe a little easier uh, knowing that help is on the way. And I want to uh, thank in advance the committee for their uh, support and certainly uh, uh, the School Construction Authority and those who are going to be testifying. But uh, these two schools, long promised, long awaited, uh, it is so important that we deliver on this promise to the people of Long Island City, and it is my honor and privilege to support this, uh, uh, these two applications, and uh, we need to make sure that we do right by the families and children of Long Island City. This is a great step in the right direction, so I want to thank the chair uh, and the committee for allowing me to be here today. Thank you very much, Council Member. Um, as a member, former member of Community Board 12, Past education chair, uh, we know the struggle um, of overcrowding in uh, Queens, especially in your district. So I am so happy today to hear testimony um, <coughs> about this uh, project, and we are always happy to see the growth of our students throughout Queens and throughout the city of New York. So thank you very much for being here today, and thank you for your support. <coughs> 
representatives from the SCA, Kelly Murphy and Michael Mirasola. We're happy to hear your testimony this afternoon. Okay, before you begin, will you please raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today before this committee and in response to all council member questions? I do. Thank you very much. You may begin. Is that on? Okay, no, it is. Sorry about that. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for having us. Um, as we said, we're here to um, discuss two new primary schools in Long Island City. Um, the first is Q341, which is an approximate... I have to stop you for a second. Will you please identify yourself for the record? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Kelly Murphy, Director of Real Estate for the School Construction Authority. I'm Michael, Mir I'm Michael Mirasol, the Director of External Affairs for the New York City School Construction Authority. Yeah, that would be nice. Thank you. I should have done that. So this, um, just to give you a general idea where we are, we're in the southern part of the tip of Hunter's Point. Um, the first school um, is located at 2nd Street and 54th um, Avenue. Um, this is part of a larger site. Um, We'll be conducting a site uh, textile subdivision, so the outline in green is where the site will be. Um, the school more along 54th um, Avenue um, with an upgrade uh, play yard. Um, this is just some uh, photographs of the site. You're looking at the school that we did with that the three, f what, which one is that one, Michael? This is looking north at um, one of the new schools. Um, just some visuals of the site. A lot, as you know, this was at a vacant area and it's part of the larger Hunters Point um, neighborhood, which is being created, which new housing, a uh, lot of affordable housing, parks, um, waterfront access, uh, community facilities, retail, um, to support this neighborhood. So um, have to start off with building the roads, sewers, drainage, you know, all that. So that's, um, for the first site, this is mostly done um, for Q341. So that's just some of the areas. This is the program of requirements for the school. It's a pre-K through grade five. Um, some of the amenities like a reading resource room, art classroom, music rooms, and then the support mechanisms of medical guidance. Um, as I said, there's both a playground and uh, early childhood playground uh, specialized. And this one will also have the special education, the D75 seats um, um, and the resources that go with that. And then this is just a, a kind of early rendering of what the school will look like. It's about uh, 77,000 square feet and four stories. Let me get out of this one. And let me get out of this one. Sorry, I did these separately. I should have done it. <laughs> and the next one. Come on, open up. Thank you. The second site is for Q375. This is an approximate 612 seat. Um, again, part of that larger uh, Hunter's Point. This is at the south. Um, infrastructure um, is still being worked on here as well. Um, and the site, uh, the tax lot subdivision has already occurred on this site, so the new um, tax lot 130 is what um, is here now. Again, this is Im early images. They're actually farther along than this. My understanding, I think June. May, June-ish, they'll be finished with the infrastructure work on this site. So there's just some early images um, of what's going on there and some of the great views. Um, this again, this is a pre-K through fifth grade classroom. This is some of the amenities in the program of requirements. And this is an early rendering of the, of the school. So now this is the technical piece of it. <laughs> um, where am I? So both sites are owned by the city and are currently vacant. 
um, and would be transferred jurisdiction from uh, Department of Housing Preservation and Development to, to the SCA. Um, this project um, was uh, the site plan, notice of site plan for both uh, were published in the New York Post and the city record on September 25th, 2017, and at which time Community Board 2 and Community Education Council 30 and the City Plan Commission were notified of the proposed site plans. Um, public hearings were hold, held on October 5th, 2017, and at the Community Education Council on no, uh, October 24th, 2017, um, and the City Plan Commission both sum all submitted um, comments in support of, of the schools. Um, the SCA considered all comments that was given and each site plan is pursuant to section 1731 of the Public Law Authorities Law and in accordance with 1732 of the PAL and the SCA submitted the proposed site plans to the mayor and city council on March 9th, 2018. And we look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Council Member Van Bramer, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, obviously, it's great news for our community that these two new schools are, are here today before uh, this committee. Um, in terms of timeline moving forward, obviously, parcel F is very close. Yes. Uh, when, when do you anticipate shovel in the ground and, and construction beginning? Well, we know the delivery date is September 21. Right. Um, this one, as you said, is, is much further along. Um, we're just waiting for all the, since it's a city site, we kind of moved ahead on a lot of these things further, you know, on design and such, and it's bid. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more or uh, less, uh, we have to get uh, the streets actually over to DOT, so then we can access the new streets to the site. So um, my understanding is that I'll be sometime in spring. For construction yeah. to start on we'll it. We'll yeah. probably, we're bidding it and it'll be awarded, and of course, uh, pending permits. Right. Permits can take three to n about uh, several yeah. months to get. So right. once the permits are all in place, we'll be we'll start. We're ready and to start there. And parcel C. C is a little bit more complicated. As you know, this site is over um, Amtrak tunnels, and there's a building, so there's um, a lot of engagement with Amtrak. So we're working on the agreement with them on how um, it's where we're digging near their facilities and their buildings. So um, we expect to actually get that in place relatively soon and finish up design. My understanding, it's still 2021 on this project. Yes, we're still calling but it 2021, but we're it's it's a little. That's iffy. not as that firm because be, of the Amtrak might be issues. Little late. It might be the following year. We're just not sure. We'll be ready to go from design point of view, and we'll be ready to s and uh, to bid the job. It's just uh, waiting for other agencies and Amtrak and all to fall right. in line. I mean, C has been delayed so much mm -hmm. for so long because of these yeah. other issues and other agencies and. And it's just really important, as you know, we have a, a crisis in, in yes, we uh, do. Long Island City, Hunters Point. Obviously, District 30 is one of the most overcrowded yeah. in the city of New York. Uh, great news that we're moving forward with these two new schools. Obviously, it's a significant investment in the future of Long Island City, but um, we cannot build them fast enough. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge that we have been joined by Council Member Levin. Council Member Barry, question? Uh, yes, thank you. I have questions about uh, the space within the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, cap the term cafetorium is becoming quite popular, meaning it's a space that serves as a cafeteria, as a gymnasium, as an auditorium. And in fact, when I was principal at PS81, that was what I had on the uh, south side of my building. One huge space, which was separated by dividers. Uh, there were fixed seats for the auditorium. But if we needed more seating, we could open the folding doors and add more chairs and what was the gym. And then on the other side of that was the cafeteria. What are the facilities that are designed for these two schools? Do you want to go back up to the? Okay. This is um, 375. This one's. This is 375? 375. So 375 is the what we call parcel F. Mm -hmm. So you can see a. Uh, so we have, as you can see, four pre-K, four kindergarten, 20 standard classrooms, CSD, those are special education rooms that the district uh, handles, and we have two of those. 
a reading resource rooms, there'll be art classrooms, a music classroom with inst instrument storage, a science resource room, health instructor, we calling it a gymatorium here. <laughs> and that is a, uh, a, a space, a public assembly space that uh, can be, can double as a gymnasium and an auditorium. And so they, a library of course, a guidance suite, medical suite, administrative suite, parent room, a full kitchen, cafeteria, and staff lunchroom, and of course the playground at grade. And for the other school? Okay. Oh, I couldn't go to that one, sorry. Get out of this side. Because my mom wanted to do it. Not this one. Which one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Oop, one more. Yeah. So this school has is very similar of the four pre-K, the four kindergarten, 15 standard classrooms. Again, this has three, oops, we don't need that. I, we can read three okay. special ed class, uh, education classrooms, a reading resource room, an art classroom, a music classroom, a science room, a health instruction room, again, another gymatorium, a library, guidance suite, medical suite, administrative suite, parent room, kitchen cafeteria, staff lunch room, and two playgrounds, a general playground as well as an early childhood playground. In addition, in this building, there'll be the District 75 children who will have uh, their own floor with eight classrooms. In each one of those classrooms will have its own toilet, a two speech rooms, three guidance rooms, and two guidance offices. There'll be occupational therapy, supervisory changing rooms, a multi-purpose room. They'll also have access to the gymatorium and physical therapy room in their own main office. And both schools have upgrade play areas. Yes. An early childhood and regular playground. Thank you. Thank you, sure. Madam Chair. Thank you. Council Member Traeger, question? Thank you, Chair Adams, and uh, congratulations uh, to my colleague, uh, to Council Member Van Bramer, for uh, championing this issue for his district. Uh, I, I love the news of building new schools. That's that's always a great, great thing. Um, just a First off, I, I have never heard of a gymatorium before. <laughs> this is a new term, and I was a teacher. And, uh, so, and I'm, I guess, just, I guess a little bit concerned about making sure that students have adequate opportunities to, um, you know, uh, have gym time, physical education, and also, but also perform and practice for performances at auditoriums or parent assembly meetings. So I'm, this is a new term that I, I, I'm going to have to kind of dig deeper with, with the DOE and SCA. Um, I, I also have a question about, is, are, are the schools being equipped with central air? Oh yes, all of our schools are fully air conditioned and fully handicapped accessible as well. Well, that's good, uh, but central air, right? Central air conditioning. Right. Yeah. And so, and I, and I do appreciate that and note that, for the record, many schools are, are not equipped with central air. Mm -hmm. and, and that is why this becomes a major, major, uh, I think, public health issue and an equity issue, particularly in communities uh, that I represent and others that do not have adequate air uh, ventilation. D does the vent does the central air also extend into the cafeteria? Yes, yeah. that's very important. Yes. Where children, you know, eat and and workers serve food as well, which is we, we've heard that from labor as well. All right, I th I thank the chair for her time. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions from the panel? Okay, I'd like to recognize Councilmember Miller. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. May step down. Thank you. Are there any members of the public that wish to testify on these items today? If so, please see the Sergeant at Arms. If none, okay, we'll wait for you.
Ms. Karen Blondel. Thank you. Please step up. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Karen Blondell, and I work with an environmental justice group. I'm actually here for something else, but I do know what a gymtorium is. And we use them uh, quite frequently uh, in Brooklyn. And there is one issue with that, and that's the noise. So sometimes they'll have like an after-school program going on in the school gymnasium, but other business going on in the auditorium. And maybe they could, you know, just consider the noise because it's really hard to hear in the gymnasium, in the auditorium, when there's active uh, recreation going on in the gym park. So I just wanted to raise that issue. We appreciate that very much. Thank you. You're welcome. You may step down. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other members of the public who wish to testify. The hearings on LUs 39 and 40 are now closed. In addition to these site selections, we will vote on two landmark designations that we heard at our meeting on February 6th. The first of these landmark designations is LU 21, the Samuel H. and Mary T. Booth House, a wood frame house designated in the stick style located at 30 Center Street on City Island in the Bronx. The second designation is LU 22, the Sears Roebuck factory produced Stafford Osborne House, located at 95 Pell Place, also on City Island in the Bronx. Both houses are located in Council Member Jonai's district, who opposes these designations. Council Member Jonai is unable to be here today, but he has submitted a statement for the record. I now move to approve the school site selections, LUs 39 and 40, with the support of Council Member Van Bramer, and in accordance with Council Member Jonai's position to disapprove the designations LU-21 and LU-22 as historic landmarks. Council, please call the roll. Adams. Aye. Barron. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Um, my question is, what do the owners of these properties, uh, what's their position? Do we know what the owners want? Yes, we do. Uh, Council Member Jonai, uh, his, his letter indicates and his feelings indicate that he opposes the designations because the owners approve the, uh, disapprove the designation. Okay, thank you. I vote aye on all. Ku. Correction, if I may. Yes. I vote aye for the school construction and I vote no on the request for landmark status for LU 21 and 22. Okay, the vote the was- The vote is to disapprove. Yes. Okay, I vote aye on all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I vote aye on the school construction. I vote aye on the school construction and no to the Samuel um, and Mary Booth House and Council Member, uh, just to clarify, a vote to approve is a vote to approve the schools. Oh, okay. To disapprove okay. Yeah, yeah. the landmarks. Yeah. So a vote. Uh, so aye. I will aye on all. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Miller. Permission to explain? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I think that I believe that it is so important that we maintain the integrity and and values of New York City, which seems to be getting away from us and that landmarks plays a very important role in doing so. Um, I am inclined, as in the council member, not to support the uh, City Island proposal, uh, which I know is the vote, but I just want to put it on the record that um, I struggle with this, but this is not a community that I know enough about um, the history and the tradition that is trying to be preserved on, by government on one hand, and so I would rely on the member and the community's and owner's expertise on this one. For that reason, I vote aye on all. Traeger. 
by a vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, with zero abstentions, the motions to approve LUs 39 and 40 and to disapprove LUs 21 and 22 are recommended to the full land use committee. Yes, Council Member Barron? Yes, just one further comment. I just want to say I do appreciate the historic work that was done in terms of uh, LU 21 and 22 and the highlights in the report which references the fact that uh, this property, particularly LU 21, was in fact uh, owned by those who did own other people and enslave them. And I appreciate the fact that that history is reported and I think we need to make sure that we always make sure that we make note of that kind of history. Thank you. I agree and thank you. The last item we will hear today is LU 38, the Gowanus Canal CSO, an application submitted by the New York City Department of Environmental Protection and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, pursuant to 197-C of the New York City Charter for the site selection and acquisition of property located at 234 Butler Street, 242 Nevin Street, and 270 Nevin Street, Block 411, Lot 24, Block 418, Lot 1, Block 425, Lot 1 for a combined sewer overflow facility to reduce the volume of sewer overflows entering the Gowanus Canal. The site is located in Community District 6 in Council Member 11's district. Speakers for this panel, Alicia West, Department of Environmental Protection, Kevin Clark, Department of Environmental Protection, and Terrell Estesen, close. New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Thank you. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and in response to all council member questions? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. You may begin. And please remember to state your name for the record. Is this on? Yes. Uh, good morning, council members and chair. My name is Alicia West. Director of Public Design Outreach for Department of Environmental Protection's Bureau of Public Affairs. I'm joined today by my colleagues from DEP's Bureau of Engineering, Design and Construction, Kevin Clark, and Terrell Esteson from the Bureau of Environmental Planning and Analysis. So we're pleased to be here to present to you our ULERP application for acquisition and site selection for the Gowanus Combined Sewer Overflow Facility. A little history. Um, after the Gowanus Canal was constructed in the 1860s, it quickly became one of the nation's busiest industrial waterways, serving heavy industries including chemical plants, oil refineries, and three manufactured gas plants. In 2010, uh, the US EPA designated the Gowanus Canal a Superfund site, identifying a number of potential responsible parties including New York City and National Grid. Uh, the EPA has required the city to remediate petroleum-based contaminants at the canal and reduce combined sewer overflows, which we call CSOs for short, you'll hear that a bunch, um, into the canal. Um, so the project we're here today to discuss will continue our agency's work to limit CSOs into the canal by constructing two underground tanks and associated head houses to intercept and store combined sewer overflows during wet weather events. The two sites are shown here on this map um, are at the head end, the first is at the head end of the canal, um, which will accommodate an eight million gallon tank, and at the bend of the canal, we call this the Owl's Head facility, um, which will have a four million gallon tank. Both sites will have above ground structures to house pumps, screens, electrical equipment, and importantly, odor control. So the ULARP application we're uh, pursuing currently is for the site selection and acquisition of the head end site. Um, which includes three privately owned parcels, namely 242 Nevins, Block 418, Lot 1, and 234 Butler Street, Block 411, Lot 24, and 270 Nevins Street, which is Block 2, sorry, 425, Lot 1. 270 Nevins will be leased as a construction staging site. Um, so following the certification of the ULERP application by the City Planning Commission in September, DP has presented to the Community Board and the Borough President's Office and received recommendations of approval with conditions. City Planning approved the application on February 14th. Um, the ULERP for the Owl's Head site will follow, but that's on a separate schedule. Um, we will also be demapping portions of Douglas Street and Fifth, uh, and Fifth Street that run through these sites. Um, this is really just a matter of cleaning up the city map. They're sort of what's called paper streets. They don't really exist. They're just on the map. Um, so I'm going to now throw it over to Kevin to speak a little bit about site selection. 
Hi, my name is Kevin Clark with uh, New York City DEP's Bureau of Engineering, Design, and Construction. Um, so at the beginning of the project, we conducted a very structured and objective siting study to identify um, uh, the best location for construction of the CSO facility. Um, the RH3 site, which is, what, uh, which is the site that we're here to discuss today, was ranked number one um, out of that um, siting study. RH4, which is the Thomas Green Park, uh, just across the street on Nevin Street, was ranked number two. And parcel one is the staging area, um, which will be leased during construction to support the construction of this facility. Um, the city fought really hard to avoid building this facility um, on the park property, as it would disrupt this important community uh, resource in an already open space starved neighborhood. Um, the EPA does, however, retain the right to force the city to build in the park um, should any of the scheduled milestones be missed. Um, those are design milestones, property acquisition milestones, and some construction milestones. Next slide. Um, zooming in on the, heads, the head end site a bit, um, here you can see the canal, um, the park in green, DEP's pumping station in red. There's an existing facility there. There's a wastewater pumping station and the Gowanus Canal flushing tunnel pumping station in that location. And uh, the, the site that we're looking to acquire um, as delineated um, by the dotted red line. Um, the RH3 site was selected because of its uh, advantageous proximity um, to uh, the RH3 uh, out, sorry, RH034 outfall um, in order to um, abate the CSO discharges um, at that outfall. Um, the flow must be intercepted prior to the outfall and um, directed to the new CSO facility. Uh, this location um, significantly reduces uh, the, the length of the large influent con conduits that would have to be constructed in order to um, uh, direct that flow into the facility and all the impacts, the construction impacts associated with that construction. Um, with this location, we are able to keep that intrusive and disruptive construction out of the utility uh, congested streets. Um, there are several other pluses with this site as well. Operationally allows us to service the facility through our existing driveway um, at the uh, neighboring pumping station, which is located on Butler Street. Um, it allows for a shorter construction period. And as you will see in the coming slides, rather than disrupt and alien, alienate parkland, if we were to build it in the Thomas Green Park, it allows us to provide a significant net increase in open space with waterfront access that will be made accessible to the public following construction of the facility. Throughout the siting study process and the ongoing community engagement, there has been tremendous support for this project, um, the improvement uh, in water quality that is going to result from it, and for uh, building the project in the site adjacent to the canal rather than building it in Thomas Green Park. And uh, we'll turn it back over to Alicia. Um, so members of the council and city planning have been doing a lot of great work with the Gowanus community as a part of the neighborhood planning study, and DEP has been working with them on that effort since the beginning. The planning study has been a really helpful touchstone for us, um, and the project team has really taken to heart a number of the recommendations that have been made. Um, we have a truly great design team on board, um, members of whom are very familiar with this neighborhood, um, and an architect who really is incredibly adept at creating buildings that work within a neighborhood's design vocabulary, but in a contemporary way. Um, so I have a few slides to sort of give you a conceptual sense of um, what we'll be building here. Um, so here you can see the conceptual layout for the head end site. The head house is located at the north, northern end of the tanks here. Um, and the tanks run below ground to the south. As we mentioned, this site um, will allow us to provide a public open space for pa passive recreation on top of the tanks um, and also a waterfront esplanade, which we hope will set the tone for future waterfront development. This conceptual rendering provides a sense of the massing of the head house here. Um, and the extent of the open space. Our design team is working very carefully to ensure that the structure fits in with the surrounding neighborhood character. You can see how the massing of the building is broken down um, and that the highest roof line point aligns with the building across Butler Street, which is the old publishing plant. <clears throat> We've conducted a careful environmental impact statement, or EIS, which has identified potential impacts in historic resources and construction noise categories. Um, three properties on our proposed project site were identified as being contributing to the National Register eligible Gowanus Canal Historic District. Um, these are at 270 Nevins, 242, 244 Nevins, and 234 Butler, shown here on this map. 
Um, there's been a lot of interest in the former Gowanus Station building at 234 Butler. And through our public outreach, we are aware that some folks in the community feel really strongly about this building. Uh, we have been and will continue to uh, coordinate with the EPA and the State Preservation Office uh, called SHPO, um, which has oversight on, of the eligible district. SHPO has agreed that due to the structural conditions of this building um, and the large-scale excavation required to build the tanks and also the operational needs of the facility, there is no alternative to demolition. However, we'll, we expect to enter into a memorandum of understanding with them um, memorandum of agreement, excuse me, with them, an MOA, um, with the EPA and SHPO to determine the appropriate mitigation to, to minimize the effects on the eligible historic district. So this could include documentation of the building, um, interpretive graphics, salvaging architectural elements for reuse, um, and members of the Gowanus Superfund Community Advisory Group uh, will be contributing their comments to SHPO in a couple of months. Um, so I have a few photos of the properties identified by Chappell. Um So the EIS also identified potential impacts with archaeological artifacts, and we're working with the Landmarks Preservation Committee and Shippo to formulate a mitigation plan for that, um, should any artifacts be identified. The EIS generally found that the construction would not present an adverse noise impact. However, given the duration and the intensity of construction, noise levels at two residences at 282 and 285 Nevin Street are predicted to result in temporary significant adverse noise impact. Um, we are working on a larger construction mitigation plan to lessen um, all impacts with construction. Um, and finally, just a little bit about our uh, schedule. Um, Construction of the head-end facility is divided into three construction phases to facilitate the sequencing of work and the construction activities by others. Um, our construction activities at the head-end facility are expected to take approximately seven years, um, with some additional time expected to be required for site remediation by National Grid. Our team has worked really hard um, on the sequencing and is coordinating closely with the EPA and National Grid to ensure that these milestones are met. As Kevin mentioned earlier, should we miss a deadline, the EPA does retain the right to make us build on Thomas Green Park, um, which again, the city feels would be a real hardship on this community um, that's already starved for green space. Um, so that is our presentation, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna reserve my questions because I wanna hear from my colleagues. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Council Member Yeager. Okay, we have questions from uh, Council Member Levy. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so the first question is, what's bigger, a, an eight million or an eight million gallon CSO tank or a gymnatorium? <laughs> <laughs> I think our tank. <laughs> okay, how many gymnatoriums is an eight million <laughs> gallon CSO tank? I don't know. Maybe we're a couple. We'll it, 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 it's uh, I'm half joking. It, this is a very large um, sighting. Um, if you just put that into some kind of context, that's that's what the. Uh, the EPA is requiring DEP to do is to cite, um, you know, facilities that can hold literally um, eight million gallons of, of stormwater runoff, so that it does not go into the new t uh, to the Gowanus Canal, um, and that's uh, uh, to ensure that long-term um, uh, CSOs are, are brought down. Um, uh, just actually for further context. Even once you build this, how many CSO uh, events will you have in Gowanus uh, approximately per year? Sure. At, so RH34 um, is the largest outfall in Gowanus Canal. Um, it currently discharges about 137 million gallons um, of CSO into the canal each year. After the tank is constructed, that would be reduced to about 33 million gallons a year. Um, and, and about six events. So we're going from about 40 events that total 137 million gallons to six events that would total 33. And so uh, explain a little bit about what that would mean uh, environmentally for the Gowanus Canal. Um, so following the upgrades of the uh, wastewater pumping station and uh, the Gowanus Canal flushing tunnel, um, the canal actually does meet current water quality standards. Um, however, uh, the CSO reductions will only further help reduce bacterial counts, um, reduce solids, improve clarity. Um, in addition, um, the CSOs that will continue to discharge to the canal will actually pass through the tank and therefore receive some additional uh, treatment, that is screening of any solid material that's mm -hmm. in, the, in that flow, um, as well as some settling that would occur as the, 
as the flow passes through the tank. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, what do you predict is the overall budget for this project? Um, so the total program for the canal that includes both CSO facilities is about $1.2 billion. Um, that includes the construction of the two facilities, property acquisition, and all soft costs. That's you know planning, design, construction, management costs. How much for this particular facility? Uh, it's a little over $500 million. Um, how much of that do you predict is going to go to site acquisition versus uh, capital construction? Um, Site acquisition for the entire program is about 190 million. At the head end, we estimate that it's about 90 million. 90 million. So, th so then, uh, over 400 million dollars just for the construction of the tank. Right. Um, this tank. That's just right. this tank. That's right. Um, uh, I think it's uh, illustrative because early on, the prediction that you were getting from the EPA was far short of that, correct? $77 million for the entire program. Right. For the entire, including both CSO right. facilities? Yes. So $77 million to now predicted to be $1.1 billion. Yes. $1.2. $1.2. So, you know, obviously uh, the city is as a, right, the, I mean, the, the city's a, a, a PRP in the Gowanus Canal Superfund and is required under federal law to be doing all of this, but it's a, it's a remarkably expensive endeavor um, and huge endeavor. Um, and I think that needs to be put into some kind of planning. Um, uh, and uh, the property acquisition is going to be th either through acquisition or eminent domain, is that That's correct? Right. That's right. Um, just uh, for the record, there's a, a current uh, use on one of the sites as a, as a uh, film studio um, that's done a significant amount of, of uh, capital investment of their own on their site. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I don't know if you can answer this, but what, uh, what the city is, uh, how the city's been engaging with that? Um, so the uh, DEP is working uh, with its partner uh, at the Economic uh, Development Corporation um, to uh, uh, we're basically working on a relocation scheme for Eastern Effects. Okay. Um, and what, if this were to not work and you were forced to look at um, RH4 as a site, which is the Thomas Green Park, um, just also for the record, Thomas Green Park is, is, um, is kind of broken down into two halves. You have one half is a um, active uh, and passive use park. Um, and and then the, the site closer to the canal, or the portion of the park closer to the canal, is actually a um, Moses era swimming pool that is used currently. Um, happens to be on top of uh, uh, a, a coal tar uh, deposit that is the responsibility ultimately of National Grid uh, inheriting that responsibility from Keyspan, inheriting that responsibility from. Brooklyn Union Gas um, to 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 eventually do that cleanup. Um, uh, the EPA was ultimately first was looking at that site as a as the, the preferable site. What what would it look like if you were to what would the park look like at the end of the day if you were to site these uh, this eight million gallon tank, um, you know the multiple gymnatoriums. Um, uh, <laughs> on that site? So um, EPA's recommendation to build it at the, at, at the build the tank at the park site I think was a simplistic view that National Grid would have to dig this big hole in order to remediate the park um, to clean up that coal tar and then we could just simply come along and um, construct the tank. Um, it just, it, you know, it was a little overly simplistic. Um, we can build the, the tank there. It, it significantly changes the, uh, the design of the tank. It's a lot more expensive um, for a couple reasons. Um, first of all, uh, the conduits that we would have to construct to um, carry the flow from RH-34 to the park and then um, the conduit from the tank back out to the, to the canal, they become a lot longer, very difficult to construct. They're deep. The streets are very congested with, uh, with utilities. Um, so there's a lot of cost there. 
Um, in addition, some other complicating factors. Um, in the park, we would try hard to reduce the footprint of the tank, but then in order to provide that same volume, you've got to go deeper. And as you go deeper, the construction becomes more complicated. Um, you will also likely run into some more, uh, to, to a more contaminated material. Um, in addition, we would have to uh, somehow uh, rebuild the park as much as we can. However, um, in order to support the tank, there is a superstructure that is required to house pumps and screens and electrical mechanical equipment to support the tank, odor control, that sort of thing. And um, that would, that, that building would have to be also located in the park and therefore you're reducing um, the amount of park space that's left behind once the tank is constructed. Have you done a cost estimate of what it would, what the overall cost would be uh, for this site if you were to do it on RH4? Yes, absolutely. It's about a hundred million dollars more. More. Okay. So, so it's, it's ultimately more expensive. Yes. Um, and just to be clear, the, the um, consent agreement with, between uh, National Grid is on governing um, manu former manufactured gas sites is with New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. That's superseded by EPA in this instance. Is that correct? That's right. Right. So, um, and e so, um, and this is all for the record, I think it's just good to make sure that this is out there and this is my understanding of it. Um, DEC is, has, has said that uh, the actual pool itself, the concrete pool, um, is an appropriate barrier for, uh, uh, for the coal tar to prevent that from, there's no seepage uh, into the pool itself. Um, and so from, from DEC's perspective, at least my understanding has been that they don't, they don't require National Grid to do remedial efforts at this time. However, um, because of Superfund and because uh, EPA is looking at the leaching of um, coal tar or the navigation of coal tar to, uh, to the canal itself, um, they are requiring National Grid um, to remediate uh, the, um, the contamination, is that right? That's right. So regardless of where the tank is constructed, uh, EPA plans to uh, force National Grid to clean up the park. Mm -hmm. um, we are aware only of a, a draft uh, consent order to National Grid, or it could be a unilateral order. That order has not been issued yet, um, but we are aware that they are actively negotiating that order. A national grid would be required then to replace the pool in kind and not and not the city. That's right. right. So then, so then the right. So the the cost of that reconstruction is not borne by the New York City taxpayers. It would be borne by ratepayers, but That's but right. not uh, the taxpayers. Um, on, but well that's helpful to know. Um, certainly around the cost estimates that you've um, uh, drawn up. Um, on the, 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 the northern end of the RH3 site um, along Butler Street, is there any opportunity um, to increase public access um, beyond what's in the current proposal um, so that, um, you know, there, there's a, um, for instance, there's a, 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 a building that is, uh, well, it's not actually on, it's not on the RH3 site, but is on uh, closer to um, the small little kind of, uh, I don't know if you can really see it, it's, it's on the, the, the western side of the canal at the edge there. Um, uh, you know, allowing for that to have kind of public contiguous access to um, the, the, the public areas that will be open um, uh, on, top of, on top of the tank. Um, so you're, I think you're referring to through the DEP's pump station, which is here in red. At the head end yeah. of the canal? The yeah, I mean, there's the pump station, and then there's this little, there's actually this tiny little building yeah. that looks like a little kiosk. A gatehouse. Yeah, yeah. Gatehouse. gatehouse. Call it, yes. um, so we've definitely been taking a look at what can, uh, can be provided uh, at the head end of the canal. Um, we do, this is an operational facility, and there's a lot of complicated stuff that goes on there, so it's, we're, we're taking a look at it. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we've got a very large crane there that is very much in the way. Okay. Um, <laughs> Something maybe to think about as this process moves forward about kind of, I mean, with the, with the goal being how do we um, have as much public access, you know, once this canal is fully clean, people should be able to have, be able to have access to it. Um, and then in terms of, um, in terms of design, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about um, 
how you're approaching the design of the actual head house facility. Sure. Which um, is going to be the public facing portion of this, the non underground portion of this uh, endeavor. Um, so here's just a reference slide. Um, so the head house, um, just as a reminder, this is where all of the combined sewage is coming through, and it's screened with these very, very large screens, and we've got odor control in here and electrical and all of that uh, good stuff. Um, so the facility is um, very technically complicated, um, but we have a really fabulous um, design team, including wonderful engineers um, and also wonderful architects, Seldorf architects, um, who are working with us on this. Um, this is a facility that is very much going to be in the public eye. Um, it is nestled into this community, and so it's really been um, a priority for us to ensure that what gets built here is um, attractive, um, but also respectful of the character of the neighborhood, um, and really provides, you know, really is absolutely not an eyesore of, uh, you know, a, a industrial facility. Um, so that, that is the goal. Um, and then in addition to that, we also have the opportunity to provide um, a public open space and, you know, as we said, um, access to the canal um, as, an, as an esplanade. So, Just so that everybody knows, when you say screens, you literally mean screens that like catch a, toilet paper, right? <laughs> like a giant, and other things. A giant sea leaves. Leaves, right? So think of like a flattened out spaghetti strainer. <laughs> um, right. You know, we're pulling out um, water bottles, tree branches, flushable wipes are a big problem for us, mm -hmm. um, all that, or non-flushable, they are not right, flushable. Right, 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 <laughs> um, misnomer. Right. right. Um, any trash that gets washed off the street. Any trash that gets washed off the street. Because it's combined sewer. Combined Everybody sewer. understands what combined sewer right. is. Right. So everything, everything it's combined. Everything. It's everything that goes down your toilet, plus everything that goes into a catch basin along mm -hmm. the street. And then there's a guy that works for DEP that's sitting there scraping. We have, you know, uh, right? we're a little more technically advanced than that at this point, which we're very that's happy That's what they about. have a Newtown Creek. I saw it. <laughs> um, the screens have basically this big rake that okay. pulls the stuff out and deposits it onto um, a conveyor belt, and then that's put into a container, and then that is taken off site. Okay. Okay. But just so that everybody knows, that's what happens. That's what's going on. Um, for the, um, the the public access portion, so the park, for, for lack of a better word. So this is going to be a DEP park. This is going to be a New York City Parks Department park. We are going to retain ownership um, mm -hmm. of the property. However, we've been working really closely with the Parks Department, um, and we, you know, to design this as a space that they are capable of maintaining. Mm -hmm. um, we hope to have an MOU signed with them, but that has to happen a little bit further along once we own the property. Okay. <laughs> To get that MOU. Yeah, we've we're been very respectful of nature their walk. needs. Um, nature yes, walk. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, you guys have any interest in closing down Nevin Street uh, <laughs> and just making it a continuous park? I think that might be a question for DOT. Okay. Because you know it's just a dead end a few blocks down. So just something to think about. <laughs> um, in terms of historic preservation, can you talk a little bit about that uh, that building that you, you referenced on slide twelve? and what the plan is for that, because it is a historically significant building. Um, so these are three separate properties. This is 270 Nevins, where we'll be having our staging site, 242 to 44 Nevins, and then this is um, what everyone calls the Butler Building. Um, er, sorry, excuse me, the Gowanus Station Building, which is on Butler. Um, I call it the Butler Building. Uh, so this is the, this is the building that um, has garnered the most interest um, from both SHPO and folks in the community. Um, and we've been um, working with everyone um, to figure out how we can uh, retain some of the more um, significant architectural elements of this structure. Um, it does have this really um, nice pediment with a terracotta plaque that has the name of the station, and which obviously is the name of the neighborhood. And you know, there's a big sort of identifying feeling with that. Um, that we want to respect and be able to retain. Um, so we've got our design team looking at how we can uh, sort of incorporate these elements into the project um, in a way that's going to conjure the history of the site um, and you know also work with the modern day uses that we're going to be putting here. 
Um, can you speak a little bit about the public engagement that you hope to do around design, design of the open space, design of the building? Sure. Um, so we uh, we have a number of sort of uh, venues um, that we have public outreach for. We've got our community advisory group, and those meetings happen monthly. That's a wider um, view of the Superfund. Um, we also have uh, the community board, which we have been to as a part of this pillar process, but also we'll be going back um, in terms of um, as the design <coughs> is progressing and before we take it to design commission and we're mm -hmm. eager to get folks's input um, on what they'd like to see here certainly any information that you have um, about what folks would like to see here would be really helpful we are in um, you know we do have constraints because this is on top of our infrastructure where mm -hmm. you know, we have to limit programming to passive recreation um, you know that doesn't mean you can't go out there and throw a ball around but it does mean that we can't you know construct a basketball court um, mm -hmm. just because we know we have to get into these tanks um, periodically for maintenance and if there were a, an emergency we we need to get in there and make sure there wasn't you know so that we can have clear clear access to our hatches um, so we're moving forward and we'll hope to hold some public forum on to get input on the public forum space is that, is that an opportunity for maybe some kind of charrette type or you know s not not um, you know, ten sessions, but something that's maybe it's a little more limited. It's a, it's a. As I said, it's a little more challenging than you know. Parks has this wonderful process um, where they can really go out into the community and say, "What do you do here? What do you like to? What would you like mm -hmm. to do here?" And um, they have a really wonderful result working from that process. Um, mm -hmm. We're a little um, limited by our Use, operational right, need, right. Um, so it's not as though it's a clean slate and mm -hmm. you know anything you want to see here we can we can do here so it do would have to be a little bit more limited and, and have you i'm sorry have you selected a, a landscape architect we do we have d land um arch landscape architects um uh -huh. and they've done a good amount of work and along the gowanus canal they're very familiar with it and all very affectionate <laughs> to the area um, okay, to the to the greatest extent possible. Um, I mean, I, th I look at I, I also represent Newtown Creek, and I look at you know the, the the public engagement that happened at Newtown Creek, where you had the selection of two um, you know well regarded um, artists to do the public installations. Bef um, George Crocus, who did um, the Nature Walk, and Vito Conchi, who did the the fountain. Um, oh, I and just to also to just to. Um, uh, in the context of the magnitude of this project, the um, how deep do the walls have to go along uh, the uh, outside of this the, the site? So the the support of excavation, the current design actually um, we plan to uh, construct slurry wall panels down to bedrock. So that's about 200 feet deep. Mm -hmm. um, the actual inside walls of the tank, the below ground portions of the tank, are on the order of about 40 to 50 feet deep, depending on where you are in the, in the tank. But your slurry wall goes down. Um, we're we're going to key it into bedrock, right? right? That's the plan. So it's 20 stories below <laughs> low grade, <laughs> right. roughly. So, um, okay, those are all my questions. Um, let's continue to, to talk about those uh, the kind of the public engagement, open space questions uh, as this moves forward. Um, but we appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Uh, we have questions from Council Member Barron, then Council Member Koop. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I represent the East New York section of Brooklyn, and we have the 26 ward water treatment plant. And we also have a uh, CSO that malfunctioned, uh, I think it was in 2016, and homeowners were subjected to all of the things that we talked about that are in the sewers coming up through their toilets. It turns out that there was some malfunction and uh, what they had to do was ensure that there is now a person physically there to make sure that everything is operating the way it should be. Do you have that provision so that those persons in that area will not be subjected to all that uh, the homeowners in my section were subjected to? I'm a little familiar with uh, the issue you're referring to at the, I believe it was at the Spring Creek Correct. Auxiliary Water Pollution Control Plant. 
Um, and uh, I, I believe you're right in the way you categorized it in that it was a, um, um, a technological failure. Yeah. Um, we, we, we've been working very hard with our um, partner bureau. We actually call them our client bureau. It's the Bureau of Wastewater Treatment. Um, so my bureau would uh, do the planning, design, and construction of this facility, but the Bureau of Wastewater Treatment would have to operate the facility. And uh, they, pre they prefer facilities that, that are simple, um, and so do we. Um, and so um, a couple things that we're doing here that I think is a little bit different than Spring Creek is that um, all of the controls at the head end of the facility are what we would call passive controls. So um, using things like fixed weirs as opposed to a gate that has to open and close less reliance on sensors that has, you know, that, that could potentially fail and then result in the type of failure um, that occurred at Spring Creek. Um, in addition, if there were to be a significant failure of this facility, um, we are actually maintaining the ability to bypass to the existing RH34 um, uh, CSO outfall. So that if something wor went wrong in the facility, um, that overflow would go out the existing outfall prior to um, impacting the drainage area and private properties and homes and that sort of thing. Thank you. And also in your documentation, you talk about the possibility of um, potential archaeological resources that you might encounter. And I'm particularly concerned about the item that says on 7th Street, the potential resource type would be uh, soldier burials from the Battle of Brooklyn. And I'm always very concerned uh, as to how we maintain and honor burial remains. Uh, we're doing some work at one of the parks in my district, and we have encountered some remains, so we had to stop and do a whole redesign of what we had intended to do. So what are your plans if, in fact, we should have discover or unearth remains? Well, first off, we consider it highly unlikely that intact burials would remain there, but it is something that's been reported and that was known from you know, the Marylanders from the Battle of Brooklyn, and there's been a lot of disturbance along 7th since then, so we consider it a, a very low likelihood of encountering anything, but we will work to put together a geoarchaeological plan for review by SHPO and the Landmarks Preservation Commission to s highlight what the likely sensitivities are, and we'll do monitoring if necessary, and even if monitoring isn't part of it, we'll have uh, an unanticipated discoveries plan so that if the contractor who's been alerted to this possibility encounters anything, there'll be a way to shut it down, notify the proper people, and do the proper um, curation and protection. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Cook? <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm not an engineer, but I want to ask you a question. Uh, are all these tanks, they have to be combined sewage? Can you do a separate the sewage to sewage, water to water? Um, yeah, you can, um, but um, the process of uh, constructing new separate sewer systems is incredibly expensive. It's incredibly intrusive in the neighborhood, um, especially in an older neighborhood like this section of Brooklyn where um, the, sh you know, the streets are already very heavily congested with um, other utilities as well. So that's, you know, water mains, gas lines, telecommunications, <coughs> um, et cetera. So it becomes very, very expensive to do sewer separation. So do, 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 do other countries uh, do the same thing like, uh, like, like us here, do, do the combined sewage, or the advanced countries in, the, in <coughs> Europe or in Asia? Do, we, I think do you know any other countries use separate systems? Um, m most older cities, uh, even in in Europe, are would be combined. Like like London, for example, mm. is, is is very much combined. I don't know what the percentage would be, but they they do have combined sewers there as well. Uh, the reason I ask that because you know when you have combined sewage, when you have overflow, it, it gets in the river and, and gets in the to the water and it smells and stains for for a long time. You know. Uh, um, 
And it's all, it's very easy to get over capacity. Now in Flushing, we have a sewage tank too, the CSO tank. Yes. So as soon as it's built, it is over capacity. So how do you, uh, on this new one, how, uh, when do you expect it will be over a capacity? It takes 10 years to build. By the time you build, you, we have more people live there, more sewage, more water discharge. So are you up to capacity 10 years later? Well, um, first, Gowanus Canal does meet current um, water quality standards. Um, it, there are no exceedances for bacterial and, and, and um, so, so that's a good thing already. And that is due to some of the, the, the last round of projects that we did there. That was the upgrade of the Gowanus Canal flushing tunnel and pumping system and um, an upgrade in uh, the Gowanus Canal wastewater pumping station from 20 to 30 and, uh, million gallons per day. In addition, when EPA issued its record of decision for um, Gowanus Canal, it specified a solids reduction of 58 to 74 percent um, for uh, the two outfalls. And that's, that's solids reduction, not volume reduction. Um, so RH34 uh, and OH007 reduced those solids discharges by 58 to 74 percent. Um, they also provided preliminary estimates of the sizing of those tanks um, at 8 and 4 million gallons um, respectively. Um, we did a lot of work on our end, and we were able to demonstrate that in order to, to, to achieve those solids reduction goals, we could actually construct smaller tanks. In the end, um, we came to an agreement with EPA to build 8 and 4 million gallon tanks, and so we're far exceeding um, both the volume and solids reduction goals that were specified in the, in the record of decision. Um, we're going to be exceeding 80 percent um, solids reduction um, and, sorry, exceeding not <laughs> Uh, sorry, exceeding 80 percent uh, volume of CSO reduction and exceeding 90 percent on solids reduction. So during the construction, I mean, since it takes so long to build this, uh, this tank, uh, uh, quality of life issues will be uh, critical around the surrounding areas. I mean, you know, the neighborhood have to uh, breathe in all this uh, dust and dirt. I mean, and the layer of traffic, all this other stuff. How are you going to take care of the neighborhood uh, so that the impact is minimal? Right. Um, I think uh, Terrell and I might need to tag team this, but just just a general comment on on the construction. I think you know the current plan where we're building at the head end and we're using uh, what we had called parcel one. I don't know if you want to bring that um, that up. Um, allows us to have one single contiguous construction site, um, which is going to help us minimize the impact on the mm. community. Um, and then there are um, some uh, plans that we have to put in place um, for mitigating um, uh, construction impacts. Um, I don't know if you want to yeah. go for it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, in the EIS, we looked closely at traffic, air and noise uh, as construction impacts. Uh, we didn't identify any traffic or air impacts, not to say it won't be noticeable. Uh, and we did identify construction noise impacts at two of the closest residences. Uh, but you know, even though we didn't identify traffic impacts, we'll be working closely with DOT to put in place uh, construction measures to maintain as much vehicular movement as possible to minimize disruption. There will be uh, odor control plans uh, and dust suppression plans. And for noise, we'll put together a construction noise mitigation plan. Not that we think we'll be able to eliminate the impacts that we identified, uh, but to minimize it um, with an identification of the most sensitive affected properties. Uh, and just to put in perspective that although we did identify and disclose uh, significant adverse noise impacts, we were looking to get to uh, an interior noise level. The standard we try to keep it is, is 45 decibels interior. Uh, with non-extraordinary noise measures, those we could safely uh, commit to, uh, those residences, the interior noise levels would be uh, 46 and 47 decibels interior, so it's, mm. it's it's going to be noticeable construction. There's going, you know, I, I don't want to downplay um, how much the neighborhood will notice 10 years of construction, but the, the unavoidable impacts identified were just over the limit. 
and uh, we had looked at whether there would be a feasible, what we call it, receptor mitigation by changing the windows, but because those sort of old loft buildings, if uh, artists work quarters, uh, and they don't have central air conditioning in it, so uh, we wouldn't be able to replace it with uh, noise-proof uh, storm windows, for instance, because it would uh, they wouldn't be able to maintain a closed window condition there. So we will be undertaking the entirety of construction with a lot of measures to minimize the disruption, uh, and what we've considered unavoidable will be minimized. Yeah, especially uh, uh, you, you have schools along the, in the, along the construction site. Do they have schools along the construction site? No? Not no. close. Oh. Not that close. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Koo. Council Member Yeager? Good afternoon. I just have a qu couple of quick questions. Um, you indicated earlier that the EPA uh, put the cost at $77 million, but the actual cost is $1.2 billion. So that's not a rounding error. Do you have any kind of uh, explanation for that great differential without saying that they just don't know how to do math or you know how to do a much better than they do? Uh, yeah, there were, there were a couple things. Um, EPA made... Um, uh, First of all, they didn't, they didn't factor property acquisition costs into, um, into their estimate. So Takes care of one of my questions. Right. So uh, for one of the tanks, they wanted us to build it in the park, and therefore there was no property acquisition cost associated with that. And then for the second site, um, they had proposed the use of uh, an existing um, city-owned uh, Department of Sanitation property. Um, so for the second site, we do feel that we can use that property, but we still need additional property in order to support the construction of the tank. Um, so that was one um, big factor. Another big factor had to do with the type of tank that um, EPA assumed we would be able to construct. Um, there are passive types of CSO tanks that um, basically become just an extension of the sewer and they don't have some of the um, complex mechanical and electrical equipment that we know that we have to include um, in the construction of this tank. So that's the screening, the pumping, the odor control, um, and, uh, and uh, the head house, the, the superstructure um, that's required to, uh, to house all that equipment. So they didn't account for any of that. Um, so a couple of hundred million there and a couple of hundred million there and adds up quickly. Soon, okay. Yes. Um, you indicated that uh, you would be acquiring the properties in RH3 by acquisition uh, principally is your desire, uh, and if not, you would be going to eminent domain. So uh, as we saw in the places in the city where eminent domain was used, it takes more than a year or two or three or four, um, as much as a decade. Have you given any thought to, have you actually already started speaking with the owners of these properties, or where are you up to in that process, if at all? We, uh, we've been talking to the property owners for quite some time now. Um, have they uh, indicated that they're a willingness to uh, sell to the city? Uh, the thing that's, uh, that we owe them right now is a formal offer. Um, so there's a very formal um, appraisal process that I believe is starting today. Um, it's going to take a couple weeks to complete. Are you waiting on the council to act before you no. proceed? Okay. No. Um, if the, uh, it's, it, this was presented, and, and just correct me if I'm mischaracterizing it, but this was essentially presented, as I understand it, um, uh, from before I got here reading and then hearing you today, that uh, if the city did not do the RH3 as proposed here, then the feds would come in and say, do it in the park, right? And they would force it. That's right. But they can't actually, f you, you can't actually do anything in the park without going to the state legislature and and asking them for permission, uh, which is not likely to be granted. I would guess, knowing that uh, I can't imagine any assembly member or state senator would say, sure, take a park and turn it into a sewer. So what, I what happens then? I mean, you know, because it's, it's kind of being presented that if, if the council doesn't do this, then your park is gone. But I don't see it really that way. Okay. And so on, on the design side, we are actually proceeding on a parallel path. We are designing both designs, so uh, building the CSO facility at RH3 and a parallel design for um, the park. Um, the city, uh, in its negotiations with EPA, in, in order to reach the agreement that we're currently in, 
um, brought up the parkland alienation issue, and EPA did recognize it as a risk, and that was helpful in, in us um, being able to, to push for building the tank in, at the head end site, but EPA, um, I, I don't know how to put this best, but they felt that um, in court that Superfund might be able to trump the um, parkland alienation issue. Um, it still would probably take some time, resulting in some delays, but they felt that they would win that battle, so to speak. Are your conversations with EPA that you're talking about in this administration or in the last administration? Uh, that would that would have been the last administration. So, so this is given the right. given the environmental record of the current administration, you're not necessarily confident, or are you confident that uh, they they would insist on proceeding with such a plan? They're not really known very well for being the greatest environmentalists that we here at the council are. Uh, it's hard to say. Okay. Uh, um, but your but your conversations are in the last administration. That's right. But we don't actually know for sure. EPA didn't say yesterday, by the way, guys, if you don't do that RH3, we're coming in and taking over your park, and we're going to force you in court to do so. The uh, consent order that we're currently working under was uh, signed in 2016. So, okay. Last administration. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and, and we're yes, doing, uh, f from, a, uh, from a performance standpoint, we've actually met every you know, milestone in that order, so we feel pretty confident that the current plan of building the tank at RH3 is what's going to happen. Or, or surely, at the very least, if the city were to be sued, it can demonstrate good efforts in compliance with the consent order That's right. to date and thus uh, ask the court for some understanding of, okay. Um, one, of the, one of the items that uh, jumped out at me um, as the chair herself was a member of a community board for many years, I was, um, uh, when Brooklyn Community Board 6, my home borough, but uh, Councilman Levin's district, uh, approved this, one of the things that they asked uh, was that in addition to the strongest possible noise mitigation, but that you uh, consider some kind of tenant relocation plan. Um, can you speak to that at all, if that's been undertaken, if there's any thought to that, what happens if a tenant lives across the street or down the block, and ac across the street and down the block, just can't take the noise, what are we doing? Uh, uh, th I mean, the, the tenant relocation um, work that we've looked at so far had to, had to do mostly with tenants that are uh, on the sites that we're looking to acquire. Um, I honestly don't know what we've done. We might have to get back to you on that. I mean, because I, I don't think that that's what the board was referring to, because obviously if you acquire the property, tenants are gone, and uh, uh, as it was described to us at the council, offering tenant relocation for the construction time period. So it would seem to me that the board was indicating tenants who are affected by the construction. We could get back to you. We, we have not undertaken looking at relocating anybody uh, in the neighboring area. We did talk and we understood the community board to be talk about offering relocation services to the businesses on site. We haven't made efforts looking at relocating people off site. As mentioned before, um, we don't, we feel that the construction duration will be a very long time, but we don't think that the impacts are the type that are going to cause people to need to move. I can tell you, um, that when uh, there was a building across the street from me um, many years ago, not that many, not that old, um, that was doing pile driving, I call it the summer of pile driving, while I was studying for uh, law school exams and I had to go to my parents' house to uh, study because I couldn't take it. Um, you know, it's, it's not, you gotta be pretty far away if you're gonna drive piles into the ground to get all the way down into bedrock, uh, 50 stories, it's, that's loud construction, and if people, you know, it's one thing to say two, three, four, five months, it's gonna, be, it's about to end, but you're talking about years and years, um, uh, and I would encourage you to to look into uh, what need be done, particularly because when community board says yes to something with conditions, um, you know, it's our obligation on the receiving end of those conditions to say, hey, you know, that's those those were the, that was the thought process of the community board at the time they said yes, and if 
they would have known that we're just going to say we're not going to do it, um, then maybe they, their vote would have been different, and maybe that would have weighed a little differently on the rest of the steps, including you know the, the CPC, the borough president, and all the other steps that follow the community board. So I always look to the first step, and you know what were those conditions? I've I've uh, voted on on hundreds of plans over my 18 years on the community board, and so many of them had conditions that we anticipate would be taken into account later on down the road. And I would encourage you to do that because, you know, uh, this may be a necessary plan, but people also have to live somewhere. Um, uh, just a few more questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. <coughs> um, the You indicated that, uh, uh, that the city is but one of the PRPs uh, in this, including uh, National Grid as a successor, and then there are others. I've read somewhere that one of number, one of a number of them. Uh, are there contributions being made to the cost of this by those other PRPs, or is this all on the city, the $1.2 billion? Um, <clears throat> so there are two main um, portions of the cleanup. One is the CSO tank um, work. The city is wholly responsible for that. By, by by a, a decree of some sort, or by a consent decree, or Reco by yeah, rest, record of decision and consent decree. Yes, and then the other um, uh, big portion of the cleanup is the dredging um, and capping of the Gowanus Canal. So they'll be dredging out some, you know, some of the material uh, contaminated sediment, um, and then capping it with uh, some clean sand. And there's a little, there's some other work that's taking place in the canal as well. And so the city, the city is a PRP, one of many PRPs for the in canal work. Um, National Grid is uh, the biggest contributor, and then there's um, a slew of other oil um, companies along the canal that have the depots there. Anybody that had some um, historical uh, presence on the canal, basically. And are we getting contribution from them towards our ultimate cost because we're doing the work? They're not doing the work. We're doing the work. So. National Grid is doing the in-canal work. They're leading it, so we would make a contribution to their work, both on the design and the construction side. Okay. Um, on the tank side, it's all us, unfortunately. In the interest of time, I will ask my colleagues I'm, to I'm, wrap. I'm done, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I, and I just uh, want to say for the record, I'm not a member of this committee, um, so I appreciate very much, Madam Chair, giving me the opportunity to uh, exhibit some nerdism. Uh, and thank you very much for taking the time to come down. Thank you. You are very welcome, and I thank you. I had one question. I said I was going to defer to my colleagues first. You asked the question um, <laughs> just now, and I thank you for that because, as you said, we are both uh, former members of our community boards. The only question that I had had to do with the noise and the mitigation of the noise, so I thank my colleague Jaeger for bringing that up. Thank you so much, and I trust that you will get back to both of us with answers that we're looking for for that question. Okay. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You may step down. And I will now call members of the public to testify on these items. I believe we have all the information that we need. So will uh, Karen Blundell of T3 Turning the Tide, Sabine Aronofsky of Fifth Avenue Committee, and Andrea Parker of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy please step up. Please identify yourselves for the record before you begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Blondell uh, with uh, Turning the Tide, which is an environmental justice group that educates uh, marginalized uh, residents on environmental issues such as the Gowanus Canal cleanup and CSOs and et cetera. Did I keep going? Uh, okay. So um, I actually live in a community. I actually live, live at the foot of the canal, which will another stage that'll be happening. So I'm very concerned um, because whatever's happening at the canal eventually is gonna reach my area, which is Red Hook, um, it, which is where the canal lets out into. Um, I'm concerned about um, several things, like you're talking about capturing solids but I have a concern about what's in the actual liquid volume. One thing uh, we're finding is that a lot of medicine is reaching our shores and affecting our marine life. Um, so I'm asking that uh, there be room left if it is built f 
for a biodigester or for something else to go in at a later date that will actually reduce some of the other toxins that are still going to be able to get into our water system. Um, so that's really important to me. Um, also speaking for the public housing residents, they are just right outside of the project scope by feet. Um, so, they're within it. oh, they're actually within it. And um, I don't feel enough attention is paid to public housing residents in regards to the fact that they are taxpayers. That, you know, I'm going to stop calling them t uh, public housing residents and actually call them taxpayers or American citizens because they have to be vetted to get into public housing. And it's really unfortunate that you have such big campuses there but the outreach and the understanding of this type of work is not really um, negated to the entire area. A lot of times public housing is left out of it or it's kind of like they only need to know a little bit. No, they need to know a lot because they're living right there on top of this. Um, as far as safety, I have issues with safety um, in regards to this plant and the fumes and things like that. Um, public housing in that area rises 16, 18 stories. I don't know how high the ventilation system is going to be on this tank. So I don't know how that's going to uh, factor in on what public housing is feeling. They also don't have central air. They use their windows all the time because there is no central heating in those buildings. So I want that to be taken into consideration as well as a neighborhood community emergency response team just to back up D DEP and everybody else who would have to come to the neighborhood or wait for a sensor to go off to recognize a danger. We need to train our residents right there in real time how to handle those situations. So um, I approve, but with conditions. Um, so, and that's it. Oh, one more thing, the trucking. So when I read, um, what I'm reading is a little contradictory because inside of this uh, description it says that the, um, the recommendation by the, the uh, community board was to barge it out, but it's actually going to be trucked out. And then it says that each rain event somebody needs to be on hand. But I think that DP was more talking about not each rain event, but more sporadic. Um, we demand that somebody stay at all times, especially because this is new. Um, um, the first thing that we're going to have to contend with is vermin. That area is uh, right next to sewer lines. We have to deal with the fact that vermin burrows are going to be disturbed in that area. Uh, a lot of times contractors cut corners when it comes to vermin control because they know the public doesn't know about brown spiders and other things that wouldn't normally bother you. But now that you're actually digging as deep as you're, as you're going to dig, we don't know what we might find there, you know. So more concern and more community engagement and more community eyes on the actual 10-year uh, procedure would be what I would want to see. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sabine Aronowski. And I am um, a Gowanus lifelong resident. Uh, I'm a mother whose child uses Thomas Green Park. I am here today um, not only as a resident, but I work at the Fifth Avenue Committee, a, a longstanding community development corporation in Gowanus, Brooklyn. Um, and I'm also a member of the board of Friends of Thomas Green Park. Um, so um, I have been active um, on this tank siting issue now um, since the EPA actually made the announcement as part of the Gowana Superfund cleanup um, that they would be looking uh, to build a sewage holding tank in Gowanus. And I've been active on this issue not only um, uh, as an individual and a person who uh, works in this community, uh, but also as a member of the uh, Superfund Community Advisory Group and also um, in partnership uh, with um, Gowanus Canal Conservancy and um, the environmental justice group that Karen um, mentioned, and uh, FURY, Families United for Racial and Economic Equality, 
um, as well as uh, with the support of uh, New York lawyers in the public interest. So um, we definitely view um, this tank sighting. Um, we are in support of it, I should say, first and foremost. Um, we are in support of the, lo the preferred location of DEP, uh, which is the RH03 site. So we are in support of that location. Um, but re regardless, um, we do have some conditions that we feel really should be addressed. Um, first and foremost, this is an environmental justice issue for the community. It's an environmental justice issue in multiple ways because you have a community that has contaminated land that has also been subject to uh, excessive combined sewer overflow coming out of the canal. So it's an environmental justice issue in that way. Um, but also, the tank siding itself is an environmental justice issue um, because of the location um, and because it threatens the only park space that we have in the Gowanus neighborhood. So Thomas Green Park is the only existing mapped park space currently in this area that is um, also anticipated to be rezoned um, through uh, the Department of City Planning. So um, we, we definitely uh, do not want to see any alienation of park space um, by, the, by the placement of this tank. Um, but regardless of where the tank is sited, um, I think the most important thing from our perspective is that the scope of the study um, does include public housing, um, Gowanus houses, and Wyckoff Gardens, and that's currently um, the largest number of residents in the Gowanus um, neighborhood. Uh, we're talking about over 4,500 residents, um, very close to this tank um, and park, <laughs> and only public park. Um, as well, um, sorry, I lost, lost my train of thought. So we're concerned about it from, from that perspective, uh, the scope, but the scope also includes the park itself. Um, so we really feel that there is a need to um, address um, the, the park itself um, in terms of whether, it, in terms of the impacts. So that is our deepest concern, regardless of where the tank is sited, is how um, will this park space be impacted um, and what will be done to mitigate that. So we've heard about mitigation for noise, but we haven't heard about how that might impact um, the park and the, the young children that are gonna be using this park um, potentially throughout this, this cleanup. So uh, you have a swimming pool, a community swimming pool, the Douglas and DeGraw swimming pool. Uh, that is uh, um, very valued in our community. It's an important community resource. And again, we just don't, I haven't, we haven't seen enough of how um, the city intends to address impacts to this park for the park space itself and for the, the users of the park. So we're very concerned about that. And we really want to see an agreement, something written in writing, some sort of MOA um, come out of this that addresses permanent replacement facilities as well as temporary if as needed. And we want it planned for well in advance of when ground is broken. So we don't want to be in a situation um, where a community is left without its only park space. Uh, that is unacceptable from our perspective. We also have um, concerned around the leasing of the um, site versus acquisition. So the staging area, so the RH03 site, the plan is to acquire those lots, but the staging area uh, directly, uh, what is it, uh, south, is, uh, is only going, the plan right now is only to lease it. So from a from a monetary perspective, we, we understand that, but also um, from a land use perspective, we're concerned because um, of the anticipated rezoning. Um, currently, that is manufacturing land, uh, and we would love to see that um, be used as an opportunity to actually increase park space in our park-starved area um, and to, again, uh, have that be thought through um, before um, before this this is approved. So uh, we would rather see that that um, not not be leased, but actually the opportunity we think now is for the city to actually acquire that. 
Um, even in this $1.2 billion estimate that we heard from DEP, there is no money allocated for uh, the park. So there's no money allocated for a uh, any sort of temporary facilities that may be needed or permanent replacement facilities. We understand that won't be that the city, that there is also other um, parties such as National Grid that will be responsible. But again, we're not seeing um, any estimates um, or um, attempts within the required scope to address these issues now. Uh, the final thing I'll mention about um, the, the um, the area is that we have a Con, Con Edison owns a lot on Butler and Baltic. You can see it right next to Wyckoff Gardens over here. Um, we also strongly feel like that would be a great place for a temporary park while all this is while all this um, construction work is happening. Um, we have spoken to Councilman Levin about this, <laughs> and we've 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 been outspoken about this issue now for years. So uh, we would love to see something in writing. Um, that is our, our, our biggest concern um, uh, in regards to this application. I think I covered what I wanted to say. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna have to speed it up because we've yep. got just a couple minutes left before the next panel comes. Okay, I'll be quick. I'm Andrea Parker. I'm the director of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. And I just want to say a couple of things about, I mean, I think Council Member Levin said a lot of the things that I wanted to say about site design, so I'm not going to repeat those. I do want to reiterate that um, this desire for a community visioning process, and I understand that there are a lot of constraints around what can go on top of the tank. However, there's also going to be this investment, there needs to be investment in the park as well, as well as esplanades along the canal. So it's an opportunity to have a charrette process that doesn't just look at the top of the tank, but says there are some constraints here, what are the activities that we want to see throughout the area, and how can we knit these spaces together? Um, I also think that though the CAG and the community board are great resources, they are a, still a small subsect of the community, and we really need to have a much larger conversation that really includes the public housing um, community in those design decisions. Um, and I, just another thing about access, I think the access to both the pump house, the gatehouse, and sort of that whole head end complex, it would be amazing if in, additional, in addition to all the important in, um, operations that are happening there, there was a way to, for the community to get around the head of the canal. Um, and I know we have been looking a lot at the idea of some sort of floating bridge or barge that could actually, people could walk across the canal on. I think that that, you know, another couple million dollars <laughs> add to the budget would make a huge difference for the interpretive power of this installation. That's all. Okay, I thank you very much. Um, noted is your thoughtful and careful testimony before this committee today, and uh, I appreciate all the time that you've taken. I see the concern that you have for your community, and we really, really appreciate it. You've given us a lot to consider, and I thank you for your time today. It takes a lot to come down and speak and, and wait and all of those good things, and you've done that, and, I, and we do appreciate that. Council Member Levin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I just uh, want to thank this panel for all the work that you guys have been doing for the last five years that we've been working on this Less. together. <laughs> all long. Karen, I'm sorry I missed your testimony, but I'll, I'll watch it online. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but again, yeah, just the, the, the work that um, Fifth Avenue Committee and Fury and Friends of Douglas DeGraw Pool, or uh, Friends of Thomas Green Park, um, uh, and everyone that's been supportive of Douglas DeGraw Pool over the years, Guanus Canal Conservancy, um, <coughs> has, been, uh, has been instrumental in ensuring that um, in this whole uh, super fun conversation that's been happening for the last eight years now that um, uh, ensuring that the community doesn't lose its park is a top priority would not have happened if it wasn't the, the work that you guys have all been doing. So I want to thank you for that. And thank, thank you, Sue. Who's <laughs> thank you very much. You may step down. Are there any other members of the public that wish to testify? Seeing none. The public hearing on LU38 related to the Gowanus CSO is now closed and the item is laid over. I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, council, and land use staff for attending today's hearing. The meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you.